scripture today uh, from uh, Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 1 and verses 13 to 15, as we think about this overarching theme, uh, one anothering, living in a gospel community, specifically today, serving one another through love. We've already sung some of this this passage, and Josh led us in singing this earlier today. Galatians 5, verse 1, then verses 13 to 15, if you've found that in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible or a Bible, we're going to put this on the screen for you to have. Follow along as I read, if you would. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. My prayer is that today as we remember our veterans and as we remember Jesus Christ, our King and Captain, and as we look into the Word that we will be gripped anew and afresh to live out a life of sacrifice and service for the sake of the Gospel. Thank you. Please be seated. Just to remind you, to recap, we've been going through this uh, series we've covered so far. The love of God is the motivation to love one another. Uh, the love, loving one another. Like a, first, uh, Jesus commands us to love one another, and then the love of God is the motivation to love one another. Loving one another as friends of Jesus. Loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ, part one and two. Loving one another with family affection, part one and two. And then a couple of weeks ago, loving one another as fulfillment of the law. And then today, serving one another through love. So we've looked at the, at the primary passages that tell us to love one another. And they've described uh, that that's something Jesus has commanded, uh, that in doing that, we are friends of, of his uh, in fulfilling the law, we're going to start looking at, at the outworking of loving one another. The first one being to serve one another. Dr. Curtis Vaughn, who was my Greek professor in seminary, has a commentary on Galatians, and he has made these observations about the book. We preached through this several years ago now. He said the first four chapters of Galatians are decidedly polemical, that is, he is making an argument. Uh, just for quickly, if you hear someone say that that's ironic, to be ironic is to be peaceful, to promoting peace. To be polemical is to be taking on an issue, arguing against it or arguing for it. In these, Paul defended his apostleship. He expounded and defended the truth of the gospel. In the final two chapters, 5 and 6, breathe the same air of controversy, but their emphasis is somewhat different. Whereas the earlier chapters stressed doctrine, the focus on these last two chapters emphasized duty or devotion. There are doctrinal utterances throughout, but the, but the force of it concerns practical issues of the gospel. And you actually see, just to remind you, that when you look at chapter 5, you have... You have a life of freedom in verses 1 to 15, a life controlled by the Spirit, verses 16 to 26, then a life of love, chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. Freedom is not a new topic in this, in this letter. This is a, a circular letter, remember, that was sent out to the churches in Galatia. He's touched on it already uh, previously, but he really begins to bear down in the text that we're looking at today. Uh, and in the, in the passage... There are two perils, there are two dangers that threaten the Christian's freedom in Christ. One, in verses 1 to 12, we're only going to look at verse 1 today, is legalism. Being bound by rules that are made up by man. 
And we're all subject to that. And legalism, you, if, you, if you understand it, is a very selfish thing. It's for self-preservation. Uh, it's, for, it's to get a, a self-esteem from people that you're a rule keeper. But it's driven by selfishness. The other danger is licentiousness. Taking license, making, making a perversion of liberty. And that too is driven by selfishness. And I hope to show you today that the way to navigate between being a slave to someone's legalistic standards, maybe even self-imposed. You know, I, I used to joke uh, growing up, I heard, this wasn't originally, but I heard, I said, I, I, don't, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't chew, and I don't run around with women who do. Uh, you know, that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of legalism, you know. Here's my list of things I don't do. Years ago, I, to my shame, if I told somebody when I was, was maybe a late teen, young adult, well, you're a Baptist, well, well what, is, what do you believe? Bad, well, Baptists, don't, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't. And so it was a, it was a legalistic type of thing. Uh, I hope to show you a way to navigate between legalism on, in one ditch and licentiousness uh, on the other, and that is by focusing our Christian liberty on serving one another. Of course, this in call, involves the call of Jesus to those of us who would be his followers, identify as his followers. The first thing out of his mouth, if anyone would come after me, he must what? Well, he must memorize all the rules of doctrine. No, that's not it. If anyone would come after me, he must no, he must deny himself. That's where it is. And self-denial is there because if you're if you're not focused intentionally, intensively, daily, hourly, moment by moment, practicing self-denial, you will end up feeding the flesh. It's inevitable. See, the flesh doesn't die. In this earth, my friend, my mentor R.F. Gates had a great description of, of, of how we deal with the flesh. He said, Bill, we need to uh, treat the flesh as we would treat a victim who has been crucified. They're hanging there, struggling. They maybe begin to whimper. Help me. Help me. Give me water. I'm thirsty. Help me. He said, when we begin to hear that, the temptation will be to, to satisfy that request. Sounds so pitiful. He said, but we make the mistake when we satisfy the flesh because when we do that, when we feed the flesh, the next thing you're going to hear is, help me. Help me. We've strengthened it. We've strengthened it. He said, what we've got to learn, the first whimper we hear is to take up a hammer and go to that cross and drive the nails deeper and deeper into the flesh knowing we will never kill it this side of glory. But we better be putting it to death. That's a command of the Scriptures. And so I want us to see today how we avoid feeding the flesh, either, either through our, our legalistic standards, which are, which are not the Gospel. Uh, they're, they're piled on to the Gospel. Uh, they distort the Gospel. They maybe even... even obscure the gospel, or and how we can also avoid the tendency we have to, in the name of liberty, just do our own thing and, and call it freedom that we have in Christ. We're going to see this under two headings. Use your freedom in Jesus Christ to serve others. Secondly, serve others as a means of overcoming self-centeredness. Let's, let's dig down to this in the time we have left. First of all, verse 1, use your freedom in Jesus Christ to serve others. Verse 1 says, for freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. When you hear the stand firm, you ought to think immediately of Ephesians 6, where Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, when he gets toward the end of that letter, says we need to put on the whole armor of God and need to plant our feet in that, that the feet that are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace to stand firm against the wiles of the devil. That's the, that's the idea of standing firm. You see... We've been set free. Paul does a little play on words here. We've been set free to experience the best stewardship of our freedom. So again, our ditches. You're a poor steward of your freedom if you let yourself be 
in bondage to legalism, legalistic rules. And you're a poor steward of freedom if in the name of freedom you go do your own thing. And the way you avoid that, the way you avoid putting me first, and have you noticed we live in a me first generation? Wow, do we ever. We have interesting terms. You, so if you have a phone, your phone probably has a camera. And with your camera, you can take a selfie. A selfie. So you can buy a selfie stick. So you can get a better angle on your selfie of yourself. I was kidding my, my young adult children several years ago when this began to be a thing. And, and, I, and I handed the, my cell phone uh, to one of the girls. I forget. And I said, here, take a selfie of me and mom. Daddy, Daddy, you take a selfie on your own. Selfies. People get triggered. You triggered me. I need a safe space. Anybody got a safety pin? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is the generation we live in. And here we wade in with the gospel that says, um, you might want to deny yourself. That's, that will be hate speech before some of us make it to heaven. Okay? It's for freedom. Christ has set us free. So, so how are we using this freedom? Well, Paul makes this, this is an assertion he makes. Consider how you're using your freedom. He moves on from this to, to this command. If you're going to be a good steward of the freedom that you have in Christ, then you're going to stand firm and purpose that you will not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, we were slaves before you were saved. And I'm speaking to some here today who are not yet Christ followers, which means you're not saved, which means you still are a slave. You're a slave to your passions. The most noble thing you do is done out of a selfish motive. Kindness to someone. Then just watch yourself on this. Unconverted people. Show a kindness to someone and they don't respond like you think they should have responded. And guess what happens? You're upset. Well, I did such and such and they didn't even acknowledge it. Well, I know you didn't do it to the glory of God then. You see, we're slaves if we're unconverted. Paul says, if you submit, and of course the Galatian, whole Galatians thing is the Judaizers have come in and said, oh, you know Jesus Christ. You've come to know Christ. That's wonderful, you Gentiles who come to know Christ. But you know, you're not experiencing the fullness of Christ if you're not circumcised. You need to do that because you need to get the complete, get the complete Jesus. Paul, he is death on that in this letter to the churches in Galatians. So don't do that. Don't submit. Stand firm. Liberty in Christ should give us firm footing with a firm focus and commitment. We gave you the acrostic a few weeks ago. We'll be coming back to that. Standing firm. That means Jesus is first. Jesus is first. What He says matters most. Maybe we can start a movement. You know, we like this. Jesus' words matter most. All right? My thoughts better line up with His. My desires better not conflict with His. Others better not conflict with His. Stand firm and refuse to be put back into the bondage that you were in before you were saved. The next thing I want you to see is that serve others as a means of overcoming self-centeredness. Look at verses 13 to 15. He says, for you were called to freedom. So he's back down to that now. If you read the two together, you hear that. It's for, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. For you were called to freedom, brothers. You were called. You were summoned to it. 
the, the word here, of course, we've talked about this word called or summons. You're, you're summoned by the grace of God. When God summons you in the effectual calling, which, which looks like and is the new birth by the Holy Spirit, whatever was happening with you before you were born again, God used circumstances and providences and the Spirit comes and He enables you in the new birth to repent of your sin, to trust in Jesus Christ, commit your life to Him. And then in that summons, you were called to the freedom that is unique in Jesus Christ. You were called to freedom, brothers, only. Here's a concern he has. The Judaizers are pulling these Galatian Christians, trying to get them into the ditch of legalistic circumcision. And he's concerned that in, if, they, if they, some have already gone that way, by the way, if they weren't careful, they would recoil and go into the ditch of a libertine antinomianism. Big fancy word. All it means is anti against nomos law. Living as if God has not placed upon you as a follower of Jesus Christ expectations, the moral law, the rule of life for the believer. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity. Interesting word there. This word opportunity in the Greek is, is base of operations. Only Paul uses it in the New Testament. Well, I'm free. That means this. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody tells because I'm free in Christ. You're, you're using freedom as a base of operations for your flesh. And you and I are supposed to be putting the flesh to death. So I have to ask myself, am I feeding the flesh or am I crucifying the flesh? You need to ask yourself that. You need to learn to ask these questions that when, you, when your, your impulses, your desires. When you leave here today, when you leave here. Now, am I going to feed the flesh or crucify the flesh? And then look at, look at what your activities are going to be. Look what you're going to be doing tonight. Feeding the flesh, crucifying the flesh. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. And there's Paul's solution. This is not haphazard. It's not coincidental. He has, he has brought this in. And I'm going to show you how intentional it is. Because this term one another comes up a couple more times in this passage. But through love, serve one another. How do I avoid legalism on the one hand? How do I avoid libertinism or licentiousness or antinomianism on the other? It is to remember that Jesus is first. Here comes the acrostic. Others are second. And if I put others second, then, then, then the why, you, has to take the back seat. If you're not careful, folks, in the name of Jesus, you will find yourself driving in the front seat. And, and the desires, the thoughts, the impulses, the activities, the words will, will be a result of a strengthening flesh rather than a weakening flesh made weaker by a commitment to serve others. But through love. So you see what he's done here? We've been reading love one another, love one another, love one another. Now, in this loving one another, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In this word here, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, comes uh, out of Leviticus 19.18. Then he says this, and I want us to look at some other passages. But if you bite and devour one another... How does that happen? When you're serving you? It's almost impossible to have the tone here, what one commentator called, this is, this, he's describing like wild animals here. If you watch uh, National Geographic, it's interesting to watch this. You know, we're supposed to Show deference to one another. If we have opportunity to eat, 
And we find someone that doesn't, we give them an opportunity to eat. A couple of lions have a piece of meat. You know, Darwin was wrong, but he used some terms uh, that, that, were, that were recognizing nature, survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. There's, this is what happens. This is, where, this is where strife comes from. Whether it's in a marriage relationship, whether it's in a family, whether it's in a neighborhood, whether it's in a church. Strife comes when others go to the back seat and you get in the driver's seat. And so he's given us this model here. And he has a reason for his concern because there is contention in the churches in Galatia. And so I want us to see something here. I want us in the interest of time to move to some passages. We looked a couple of weeks ago at Romans 13.8 owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves and others will fill the law. It's the, same, it's the same mindset as what he says here, citing Leviticus 19.18. Let's think about the example Jesus sets for us real quickly. John 13.15, For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I've done to you when he washed their feet on that night of Passover. I've given you an example that you should also do this. Because if you don't follow the example, what, do you, what happens to you? You begin to think, well, Stephen, you know, nobody's washed my feet in a while. When did my feet get washed? What about me, mine, my, I? It happens. If you're not following the example, Jesus didn't say, I've given you the example so that you have every reasonable expectation that someone ought to wash your feet. No, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, 4 to 7. Paul says, we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Paul says, Here, here's, here's how you can biblically anchor the reality of your having been chosen by grace because our gospel came to you not in, only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, with full conviction, you know what kind of men we were proved to be among you for your sake? And you became imitators. The word there is, it's, it's mimitas. We get our word mimic from that. Imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example. Look at this. Jesus said, I've left you an example. Paul says, you became an imitator of us. And in, in, in imitating us, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. I could write to them, speak to them, and say, you need to see what's happening. You need to see what's happening in Thessalonica. Let me tell you what those folks did. You're an example. Serving one another, you're to be an example. People should learn how to serve one another from hanging around you. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2, 21. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you. He's talking about suffering as a Christian, leaving you an example. That word there, remember, we've, we've looked at this before, we went through 1 Peter, is the word writing under. Remember this? We've talked about this. When you learn to do your ABCs, Ms. Abbott, my first grade teacher, we had the big chief notepad and it had the little, had the solid lines and the middle dotted line and Miss Abbott had the letters all around the room and those things. And, and, and we were looking at those and she would write them on the board and, and show us how to, you move up here and then you move down here and then you cross it at the dotted line. That's an A. And so we did that. We were writing under. We were copying, copying, copying. That's what Jesus did. That's, we're to trace the life of Jesus. We're to trace the servant heart of Jesus and say, oh, well, I'm not very good at that. See, we do. Well, I'm not very good at that. That's an excuse. No, I'm not very good at that means get out the big chief pad. Copy, copy, trace, work, over, over. And you know today, some 60 years later, I make a pretty good A. And it's good too because my last name starts with an A, so you want to be able to see that. I can make a really good A. Blindfolded. Jesus' example. 
this example that we think about others. Listen to the others real quickly. Romans 2.21. You then who teach others, he's talking to teachers here. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? In other words, do you, do you stay in the classroom and teach and then go on and do something totally different, very different from what you're teaching? There's a word for that. It's the Greek word hypocrites. Paul's challenging. Do you not teach yourself? Are the lessons lost on you? Honor God. Honor the Word of God. Do you? 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest having preached to others, talking to preachers here, I myself should be disqualified. Paul, Paul was concerned. He said, I want to be real on this. I don't want to travel all over the world preaching the gospel and then find at the end that I am reprobated, that I'm cast into hell. That's what he's talking about here. 2 Corinthians 5.11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Do you really believe judgment's coming? Do you live like judgment's coming? Will you walk out of here today, live your activities this afternoon and this evening as if you really believe judgment is coming? Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What we are is known to God. I may not know it about you, and you may not know it about me, but it's known to God. And I hope it is also known to your conscience. In other words, I, know, I, hope, I, I hope you would not be surprised, Paul says, to know that I have a holy fear of the judgment coming. I want to be found faithful, and I want, I want you to be found faithful. I want to persuade you. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. The, the passage where, where we get in verse 5, let this mind be in you. He says, do nothing. So how much are we allowed to do? One thing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. If we do one thing from selfish ambition or conceit, which we have, which we do, which we will, we need to repent of that. But if we do one thing, we've done more than the Scripture commands is legitimate and allowed. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do you do that? Do you approach worship thinking about others? Or do you approach worship thinking about yourself? Because if you do, you're, 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 you're violating this, this commandment here. You're ignoring it. Do you ever think about your, what your absence might mean to somebody? Someone come and, and, and look and say, well, gee, I wonder where so-and-so is. I thought this was important. Hmm, I might have been mistaken. It must have been mistaken. It must not be important because so-and-so is not here. Others. Others. What are you doing? As you live the Christian life, in the life of the church and in, in, in the home and in the neighborhood, to show that you have a concern for others. If others follow you, where will they go? This little thing I, I made up years ago. If every church member was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? He said, let each of you look not only to his own interest, you, you, you need to do that, we have a measure of self-interest, but also to the interest of others. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Well, don't have a sleepy Christianity. Oh, gosh. Oh, I'm so tired. No, Paul says, ah, others are sleeping. Wake up. In fact, he does that in, in, uh, in Ephesians. Wake up! You who are sluggish. A warning. Because we looked on Wednesday night in the Proverbs. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. And the devil says, great. I've got him. I've got her in the hammock of complacency. Not thinking about Jesus, not even thinking about others, just resting. He loves it. In the church, we, we sang earlier, oh, church, arise and put your armor on. We're in a battle, folks. We're not on a cruise. Fully armed. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Are you taking in with a view to giving out? 
you know, a stagnant pool just takes in. Got to have flow. Inflow, outflow. Others. Others. You know, we said a while ago, Veterans Day is tomorrow. We, we admire the service and sacrifice of those who wear the uniform of this great nation. Do we as followers of Christ, who have the robes of Christ's righteousness placed upon us, imputed to us, we've been looking at that on Sunday nights, a wonderful study on justification, justified by faith alone. Do we not run the risk of appearing as hypocrites when our commander... Lord Sabaoth, the captain of the armies of heaven, has taught us in John 15, 13, and 14, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And what did we start this series with? A new command I give you. That you love one another as I've loved you. You see? Do you think about that? Do you think about how can I serve? How can I serve? In your home, how can I serve my spouse? How can I serve my children? Children who are growing, how can I serve my mom, my dad? In your neighborhood, how can I serve my neighbors? Hopefully, getting them to say, why are you doing this? And what a wonderful, wide-open door for the gospel. In the church, how can I serve? I want to challenge you. Your attendance is a way of serving others because if they see you there, they think, this must have value if so-and-so is there. And by the same token, if they don't see you there, and you have not served them well because you sent a message that this is not important enough for my time. My time is better spent with my flesh than showing I'm a friend of Jesus by obeying Him than showing that I love others and I esteem others more highly than myself. What would happen in a church that sells out Every member, lock, stock, and barrel. God being my helper, Jesus will be first in my life. Others will be the focus of my life. I will look for ways to serve them. I will look for ways to bless them. I will look for ways to love them. Because see, the rest of the things we're going to be looking at in this thing, provoking one another, edifying one another, caring for one another. You see, one anothering, folks, one anothering, it's impossible for you to, for you to be in the driver's seat and one another be underway. And I would suggest to you it's impossible for Jesus to be first if you are in the driver's seat. Will you recommit? Will you, will you walk out of here today thinking, man, I need to serve. I need to intentionally serve. Surprise someone by serving them. Take the towel, the wash basin. Jesus said, I've left you an example. It's not complicated, but it's powerful and it's effective. Serve one another out of love for Christ and through love for them. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we bow before you in Jesus' name. Oh, help us. Help us to make the connection, Lord. I, your word does it so plainly, and yet we want to treat it like it's complicated. Help us to make the connection that the true, real, lasting joy is never found when we put ourselves first. It is only found when Jesus is truly first, not in not, not lip service, but I'm that our mind is fixed on him. Asking ourselves, what, what words has Jesus given me that I that I need to be sure 
my life lines up with. What does Jesus say on this matter? And then others, others. Oh, God, help us. Help us to get over expecting others to bless us. Help us to get over asking, why aren't others noticing me? Help us to recognize that the others in the Scripture is a call for us to show them, us to love them, us to serve them, us to bless them. That's why others is in the Scripture. And then get that acrostic right. Jesus, others, and ourselves. You. And find real gospel joy that deepens the longer we serve you, that deepens the more we invest in others. Help us to realize we have an accountability to you, an accountability that we covenant that every month. Expectations. And help us to seize these opportunities now to bless one another. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing before we dismiss.